Okay, today we'll be going over chapter two from Concepts of Biology. This chapter deals with chemistry of life. So here's an example of DNA molecule, an uh, illustration of DNA, DNA molecule. It's a double helix DNA molecule. It's called a double helix because <clears throat> there are two of them. <laughs> Nucleic acids are the macromolecules made up of repeating units called nucleotides that direct cellular activities such as cell division and protein synthesis. Each nucleotide is made up of a pentose sugar, nitrogen space, and the phosphate group. There are two types of nucleic acids, DNA and RNA, and they're all made up of atoms. So what are atoms? The matter, which occupies space and has mass, are made up of elements. And the elements are that which cannot be broken down further. And the atom is one unit of that element. There are 118 known elements and 92 occurs naturally and fewer than 30 occur in living cells. Why do we take uh, mineral supplements? Minerals are often elements in their ionic forms, ionic salts. <clears throat> and minerals are also often function as cofactors for the enzymes. So for instance, iron is a cofactor for hemoglobin. All atoms are made up of protons, neutrons, and electrons. Exception is the hydrogen, which only has one proton and one electron, and no neutron. Proton has a charge of plus one, and mass of one. Electron has charge of negative one, but mass of about zero. It has a negligible mass. Neutron has no charge, which is why it's called neutron, but has a mass of one. <clears throat> and how do, how do we describe an atom? You describe an atom's mass using the atomic mass unit, or AMU. Uh, this is also known as the mass number. Isotopes have same number of protons, but they have different number of neutrons. So carbon-12 contains six protons and six neutrons, ergo mass number of 12, and the atomic number of six, which is the same as proton. But isotope carbon 14 contains six protons with eight neutral, eight neutrons. So what is its mass number? Protons plus neutron, eight plus six, or 14. That's where that name comes from. So here's the uh, periodic table showing all known uh, elements. Atomic number is shown on the left, on top. The symbol name is in the middle. Atomic mass is under the symbol. And the columns, like here, shows the number of electron on the outside of the atom. And its chemical reactions depend on that, uh, on those electrons on the outside, or valence shell, what we call it. And the carbon dating is made possible because C14 is continually made in the atmosphere at, uh, at a uh, constant rate. So how does carbon dating work? C12 turns into C14 by cosmic rays constantly. And it's constant because the amount of cosmic ray is constant. And the plants constantly <laughs> fix these carbon isotopes into glucose and, uh, and other carbohydrates. And obviously animals eat the plants. Other animals eat the uh, lower animals. So the level of carbon-14 remains constant in a living organism. It's about as same as in the level same as the level in the atmosphere. But once organisms die, it no longer ingests this carbon isotope. And carbon-14 decays to carbon, or decays to nitrogen-14 by beta decay. And it takes any, something like 
5,730 years for about half of originally fixed carbon-14 to decay to nitrogen-14, meaning 5,730-year-old uh, uh, 5, 5, specimen has half the C14 to C12 ratio compared to the original sample. So we said valence shell electrons are important for uh, chemical bonds. So what are these bonds? Well, first, how does carbon even get fixed by the plants? Carbon fixing requires forming bonds. And what are these bonds? There are three types of bonds, ionic bonds, covalent bonds, and hydrogen bonds. Ionic bonds involve charged interactions between different charges. Covalent bonds involve sharing electrons either in a polar or nonpolar bond. And hydrogen bonds are, are dipole interaction. And these are what we call polar covalent bonds. And there's also a van der Waals interaction, which is similar to hydrogen bond, but without the, uh, without the H, but due to charges. So here's a water molecule with polar covalent bond. Its polar <coughs> covalent bond arise due to these partial charges on hydrogen and then on oxygen. Oxygen tend to hoard more of the negative charge, so oxygen becomes partially negative, and that makes proton or hydrogen partially positive. Here's an example of nonpolar covalent bond, methane shown here. Here's an, oct uh, here's an oxygen gas, O2, with two bonds, or double bonds, between them. And here are the three water molecule displaying hydrogen bonding. These are the charge interactions between negatively charged oxygen and partially positively charged hydrogen. <clears throat> uh, it just comes down to water. Water is essential for life on Earth. About 60 to 70 percent of human body is made up of water. And hydrogen and oxygen in water form the polar covalent bond, differences in charge distribution. And oxygen hoards more of the electrons. This results in a dipole moment. Net dipole moment is that way, towards the oxygen. And it's partially, it's negative here, it's positive here. And this is what allows this, these hydrogen bonds to form. It's a charge-charge interaction. Uh, this results in polar molecule, like sugar, to dissolve in water because polar molecules are hydrophilic, but non-polar molecules, like oil, do not dissolve in water. They're hydrophobic. That's why they float on top of the water like this. Uh, properties of water, import, one important property of water is that it stabilizes the surrounding temperature, or temperature in general. When you sweat, as your sweat dries, you, your body cools down. Why is that? Because you use energy to break the hydrogen bond in your sweat, in your water, or water in your sweat. That energy is your body's heat. That's why you, uh, your body cools down as you sweat. And temperature is the measure of kinetic energy. So higher the motion, higher the, uh, higher the temperature. And water being liquid forms hydrogen bonds rapidly, which means you can water can observe heat and change temperature minimally. And this is what we call heat capacity. It ha water has high heat capacity. It can absorb a lot of heat without changing temperature. And why is San Jose so much more, so much cooler than Merced? Because San Jose is right next to the ocean. And the ocean water is absorbing all the solar radiation. Um, water can also form lattice-like structure, shown here, through the hydrogen bonding. 
And this is the reason why it flows in water, because the rigid lattice structure formed by uh, hydrogen bonding, when it freezes, it occupies less space, or it's less dense. So the water flows, flows under the ice, and ice flows on top of the water. That's why ice floats to the top, ice. So then why don't fish freeze under, the, under a frozen lake? Because ice provides insulation. Ice froze from the water because of the air outside. So the water flowing under the ice is always below, always, always above the freezing temperature. If it was below, it would flow to the top and become ice. How do the fish under the water and under in a frozen lake breathe. They can breathe because there is a limit, limited amount of oxygen diffusion through the ice, but also water retains a lot of the oxygen that's already been dissolved so that they last throughout the winter. Polar covalent bonds is what underlies water's ability, ability to serve as a solvent. And table salt is sodium chloride. And table salt has an ionic bond between the sodium plus ion and chloride mi minus ion. And water has partially positive charge and partially negative charge. So it can form a sphere of hydration around both sodium and chloride using these partial charges. For chloride here, it uses the partially positive hydrogen to form the hydration. For a positive, positively charged sodium, it uses negatively partially charged oxygen to form the hydration. How is that possible? Again, it goes back to dipoles, both slightly and negatively and positively charged. Some other properties of water. Cohesion allows water to move up from the roots to the leaves. That's stated simply, but cohesion, without cohesion, this cannot occur, then trees cannot survive. And what allows cohesion to occur? Well, cohesion results directly from hydrogen bonding in water. And water also allows us to dissolve CO2 in our blood. And having CO2 dissolved in our blood allows us to be buffered. It's a strange concept. But using the carbonic acid, H2CO3, and bicarbonate, H HCO3 minus anion, using both of these things in our blood, we are buffered because if proton concentration increases or acidity increases, bicarbonates will combine with the proton to create a bicarbonic acid and limit the decreases in pH. If hydroxyl group concentration increases, carbonic acid will rapidly dissociate into bicarbonate and proton ions, and the proton ions will then combine with hydroxyl ions, limiting the increase in pH. Remember, increasing pH is more basic. Decreases in pH is more acidic. So there are uh, four main uh, types of biological macromolecules. There are the carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, and nucleic acids. And they're all very important components of the cell and perform a wide array of functions and make up the majority of cells dry mass. And bio uh, biological macromolecules are organic, meaning it has carbon backbone or carbon based. But why carbon? Because carbon is the smallest element that can form four covalent bonds, as you can see in methane example here. One, two, three, and four. 
and this allows carbon to form a long chain molecule while being very stable. And obviously for fatty acids, amino acids, glucose, things like this, this long chain is absolutely uh, necessary. Here's an example of fatty acid. Here's a carboxylic acid group and this long chain of carbons. And here's an example of amino acid. Stop! And here's an example of glucose molecule. So let's delve into a little more details on each of these molecules, macromolecules. Carbohydrates, obviously we know carbohydrates a lot. Low carb diets, recarb load before important competitions if you're an athlete. It's an essential part of our diet. Grains, fruits, vegetables are all natural sources of carbohydrates. And they provide energy to the body through glucose, which is a simple sugar. They also have other important functions and they all have this formula in this ratio, one to two to one. There's one carbon, two hydrogen, and one oxygen. And you can classify these carbohydrates into monosaccharides, saccharides, disaccharides, or polysaccharides. So monosaccharide, mono means one, saccharide means sweet, typically are three to six carbons, and they use the suffix O's, so triodes, pentoses, hexoses, they all are sugars. Triose is a sugar with three carbon, pentose is a sugar with five carbons, and so on. And they're typically found in a ring form, not a chain form like this over here. In, in a solution. And glucose, shown here, has the formula C6H12O6. Again, the ratio is 1 to 2 to 1. It's the source of cells energy. Cellular, cellular respiration turns glucose into ATP. And it's the photosynthesis that turns CO2 into glucose. This is what carbon fixation is. And the excess glucose is stored as a starch in a plant, and that's what we eat. Um, galactose, which is part of a lactose, fructose, which is found in fruits, are some other common monosaccharides. They also have the same formula as the glucose, C6H12O6, but they differ structurally and because of that chemically. And these are called isomers. So only difference really here between glucose over here and galactose is the location of this hydroxyl group. And difference between uh, glucose and fructose is presence of double bond here, double bond the carboxyl S group, whereas carboxyl group is over here. On glucose. And when these two monosaccharides undergo dehydration reaction, that is removing OH and H from these molecules, then that is called a dehydration uh, reaction because it, they uh, together form a water molecule. So essentially water is leaving these two molecules. And also every single one of these OH molecules, OH, all these OHs, they can form a bond with any of the H's, any of these H's. So given a Glucose that's going to dimerize with another molecule of glucose, for instance. Given a single hydroxyl group, it has five other H's that it can combine with. And there are five hydroxyl groups on a single molecule. That means five times five, or 25 possible co uh, bond combinations just between combining two sugars. 
just creating that uh, sugar dimer, there are 25 possible combinations. That's how incredible biopolymers are. So how many possible uh, combinations are uh, there? Are, are there given a three sugar molecule? Well, it's six times six, five times five times five. Six sugar molecule is five times five times five times five times five times six times. <laughs> it's five raised to the power of six. Uh, polysaccharides are how uh, what forms from adding multiple adding and the polysaccharides are the ones the molecules that form from adding many 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 of those my, uh, sugar monomers. Example of that is starch, glycogen, cellulose, and chitin. They're all made from sugars. They're all uh, used by different uh, things. Starch is found in plants as amylose or amylopectins. They're also polymers of glucose. They're stored in roots and seeds. Glycogen is a stored glucose a, a polymer that's found in humans and animals. These gets broken down to release glucose. And cellulose are the natural biopolymers. These make up the cell wall of plants, wood, and paper. They're mostly cellulosic in nature. And there's just one other uh, uh, polysaccharide called the chitin that's mainly made from sugar molecules. For example, chitin is here. But they have this protein or amino acid residue attached to it. That is an alanine. It's a nitrogenous, and that's why we call that nitrogenous carbohydrate. Now, moving on to another class of macromolecules, lipids. Lipids, we tend to have some negative connotations regarding it because of fat and all that stuff. But lipids are absolutely necessary, and they perform valuable functions. They're typically hydrophobic insoluble in water, and they're non-polar molecules. They can store energy as fats, provide insulation. Look at this outer here. It has fur and coating that repels water and elements because they release these um, hydrophobic lipid from their glands, and it coats the fur and their skin with it. And lipids are also the building blocks of many hormones and plasma membrane. And lipids include fats, oils, waxes, phospholipids, and steroids. So a fat molecule consists of a glycerol and fatty acids. So glycerol is this part here. And fatty acids are this part here. And there are three of them, and three. Okay. So this is a triglyceride because it has the glycerol and three fatty acid chain stuck to a glycerol molecule. Uh, fatty acids can be either saturated or unsaturated. Saturated fatty acids are saturated with protons, meaning they don't have a double bond. Unsaturated fatty acids contain double bonds. Uh, unsaturated fats tend to be uh, liquid at room temperature or oils. If it has one double bond, it's called a monounsaturated fat, and olive oil is an example of that. It's a very healthy fat. If it has, if it has more than one double bond, it's, we call that polyunsaturated fat, and the canola oil is an example of that. And some fatty acids are essential, meaning your body cannot synthesize it, so they must be supplemented, supplemented through diet. And two of the known essential fatty acids for humans are things like omega-3 and omega-6. The 3 and 6 refers to, to the uh, uh, third and sixth carbon that has the double bond from the counting from the end. So for instance, here's an unsaturated 
fatty acid that happens to be omega-6. And the reason that it is omega-6 is because 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and the sixth carbon from the end possesses the double bond. Omega-3 uh, fatty acids are found in fish like richly found in fish like salmon, trout, and tuna. It's very important for brain function, normal growth, development, and they may prevent diseases like heart disease and cancer. Just more uh, briefly, more information on fats, steroids, and waxes. Uh, phospholipids are the major part of the plasma membrane. It has the two fatty acid chains attached to a glycerol. And that glycerol also has a phosphate group on it. So here's the glycerol molecule. And here's the phosphate that's attached to the end of the glycerol. And here are the two fatty chain, fatty acid chain. And that is a phospholipid. And this is what makes up your plasma membrane. Um, the fatty acid chain is hydrophobic, but the phosphate group, due to these negative charges, is hydrophilic. And it behaves similar to soaps. Soaps are similar to uh, phospholipids. Cell membranes are the bilayer of phospholipids, and the phospholip phosphate groups face the water. Uh, steroids also serve important functions. It has four carbon rings. It has one, two, three, four rings. The example of a steroid is a uh, cholesterol, and it's synthesized in the liver. And many hormones, vitamins E and K, bile salts, all are made from steroids. And the steroids also form a valuable part of plasma membrane in animal cells. And waxes, and waxes are also made up of hydrocarbon chains. B-wax, lanolin, as well as wax coating on plant leaves, they're all made from lipids. Now let's move on to proteins. Proteins are the most abundant organic molecule in a living system. They provide structural, regulatory, contractile, and protective functions. They are involved in transport, storage, membranes, as part of membranes, they form toxins, they sometimes function, they often function as enzymes. And each cell contain thousands of different proteins. And each of those different proteins have unique structure and functions. And they're polymers of amino acids. And fundamental structure amino acid is demonstrated here. Only the R or the side chain group differ or vary among 20 different uh, amino acids. Those are the only differences. So how many different combinations are possible? for a polymer that's made up of 20 different amino acids. That's why they're so abundant and they're so diverse and uh, unique and so on. Uh, here's some of the alanine and valine are, non, uh, are uh, amino acids with non-charged uh, side chain groups. Uh, lysine is a slightly basic amino acid because of this uh, ammonia group attached to it, amine group. Rather. And aspartic acid is slightly acidic due to this carboxylic acid being attached to it as a side chain. So functions of proteins are very diverse. There are 20 different amino acids that form long chain and amino acid can be in any order. And enzymes are made up from proteins, and they function as catalysts and biochemical reactions. And each enzyme is specific for a given its substrate. 
for instance, salivary amylase is for amylose. Is found in your saliva. And they, some of the proteins function as hormones, signaling molecules that regulate physiological processes like growth, development, metabolism, and reproduction. Uh, insulin, for example, is a protein hormone that regulates blood glucose levels. And it's the sequence that determines the protein's shape, size, and function. And the peptide bond is a special bond that hold together different uh, amino acids into a polypeptide. polypeptide. <coughs> shape, uh, protein's shape is absolutely critical for its function. And there are four levels of protein structure. One is this primary level, or the sequence itself. The secondary structure is the folding pattern based on the backbone. Only the backbones are interacting, not the side chains. And they form things like beta pleated sheet, alpha helix, and so on. And it's these secondary structure that fold in three-dimensional space to create this tertiary functioning structure. For some proteins, tertiary structure is the final structure. But for some multi-unit protein enzymes and complexes, quaternary structure is required and this involves combining several different three-dimensional structure hemoglobin will be an example of that there's a quaternary protein structure containing two myoglobin chains uh, proteins and unique shapes if you their uh, shapes can be altered sometimes reversibly or sometimes irreversibly and if it's altered we call that if the structure is altered we call that denaturation and changes in temperature pH or exposure to chemicals can change the protein structure it's reversible if the primary structure is preserved if the denaturing reagent is removed if it's reversible, then it leads to loss of function, like when egg is fried and turns white. That's a loss of function of egg albumin proteins. And this is why we use heat to sterilize things. Then why don't thermal vent or heat vent bacteria die in the heat? Those special bacteria that live in thermal vents at the bottom of the ocean, they have different protein sequences that allow proteins to link covalently. It's called cis bridges. That makes them much more resistant to heat. And if a unique shape of a protein is crucial for function. In sickle cell anemia, hemoglobin chain B, beta chain, has one single amino acid substitution. And because of the change, typically a disc-shaped red blood cell turns into this crescent-shaped blood cell that causes serious health problems. And nucleic acids, obviously they get, this is the uh, genetic uh, blueprint of the cell, and carry instructions for functioning of cell. DNA is the genetic material for nearly all living organisms. Well, I shouldn't know, I should say all living organisms. Viruses use iris, uh, RNA as their genome, but virus is not considered a living organism. And RNA is involved in protein synthesis. And DNA never leaves the nucleus of the cell in a eukaryote. And DNA, both DNA and RNA are made up of monomers known as the nucleotides. Example of nucleotides shown here. Uh, each nucleotide has nitrogenous base, a pentose sugar, pentose is 5, 1 carbon, 2 carbon, 3 carbon, carbon 4, carbon 5. So that's a pentose sugar and the phosphate group.
um, DNA is double helical structure. Uh, two strands are bonded to each other at the bases using hydrogen bond again. And each strand coil about each other, and which is where the name double helix comes, comes from. And Watson and Crick are the ones who solved that structure, won the Nobel Prize for it. But Rosalind Franklin was the uh, crystallographer who generated the data. Um, we have just a couple more slides to go for today. Um, how many neutrons do uh, potassium-39 and potassium-40 have, respectively? Normal potassium has 19 protons and neutrons. But these isotope mass units are much greater, is, are greater than 39, or 38, I'm sorry. This one has extra one unit. This has extra two units. So their mass difference must be coming from their, the number of their neutrons. So think about that. Um, why are hydrogen bonds and van der Waals interactions necessary for cell? We talked about many, many examples of this. The, these are the weak association between what type of molecules. Hydrogen bond occurs in proteins, water, DNA. Without these bonding, their proper shape cannot exist. Is that beneficial for a cell or detrimental to the cell? How can some insects walk on water? Insects are denser than water, but they walk nonetheless. It's because of the surface tension. Surface tension refers to resistance to breakage at the surface interface. That is caused by, again, hydrogen bonding. Why is water an excellent solvent? External solvent because partial charges due to what? Water, water's oxygen having tendency to hoard more of the electrons than the protons. We call that partial charges. Uh, explain at least three functions that lipids serve in plants and or animals. Hormones, vitamins, cell membrane, energy. They do so many different things. What happens even if even what happens if even one amino acid is substituted for another in a polypeptide chain? Common blood disorder? Yes. Name is sickle cell anemia. It's called sickle cell because cell looks like a sickle. Okay.